Hello, and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. Today, you're hearing my conversation with Lisa Jaster. Lisa graduated from the Military Academy in 2000, followed by multiple deployments on active duty, a break in service, and then back to the Army Reserves. We talk about thinking big picture and how doing smaller day-to-day actions to put good into the world are often more important than bigger gestures of kindness. We talk about her love of fitness and how to use fitness as a way of advancing mentally. Turns out we both enjoy endurance sports. So we talked about triathlons and a recent 52K ultra marathon she did. That fitness was put to good work when Lisa became one of the first women to attend Army Ranger School and received the tab. Lisa talks about the adversity facing that first class and how the Army is evolving around diversity. Please enjoy this conversation with Lisa Jasper. Lisa, thank you so much for being here with me today. I, I want to start out by trying to sum up what I think uh, would maybe do your career justice, which would be very difficult. You've got a long, uh, long military career, and I want to make sure that we honor that. I have a quote from you from an article uh, that I want to cite. Oh, <laughs> don't cringe. It's not a bad one. <laughs> uh, no, no, this isn't an expose interview. Um, <laughs> The, the quote goes, it's important to try to do hard things, but it's also important to look at the big picture and see how you can add to society and maybe make the world a little bit better. Will you talk me through that? I think the headspace I was in at, at that time is I get really frustrated because people think about, let's, let's talk about Ukraine and Russia, right? What can we do? And we're talking at this these big global levels, we're talking about big changes, how can we help people, but yet we walk by somebody next door to us who's crying and suffering. And so like, it's important to do big things. It's important to have those change agents, but it's also important to donate blood and smile at somebody who looks sad and try to really impact the world around you. And in this world where we hold people up for the big things that we that they do, we sometimes forget how important all those little day to day actions are. And so really with that, I, I'm trying to get to the point or was trying to get to the point of those little things being impactful on your community really needs to be step one before we think about it, it's great. It's great to donate money or, or send send someone or even volunteer to go. I went to Guatemala last summer on a a team Rubicon volunteer mission. And and that was fantastic for two weeks. But if you do big, glorious things like this, like, like volunteering two weeks of your time, but you're a butthead to the guy who sits next to you in church, are you really improving the world one person at a time? you know, those big things need to happen. We need the, the multi-billionaires of the world to donate to save the children. But that's not, that's not where our headspace should be. That's not where we should be, each individual should be thinking. It doesn't, if you're, if you're not a good person, but you throw your money at good causes, that good money you're throwing at good causes is still beneficial. But are you really making the world a better place just by throwing money at the problem? Now, if that's all you got is money, great. And if all you have is time, great too. But in the world we live in right now, I think being nice to your neighbor is is much more important. And, And the reason why I say that is, and I know I said before we even started this discussion, hey, I don't want to talk about politics, but if my next door neighbor is a hyper conservative and my other next door neighbor is hyper liberal and I'm sitting in the middle of them and I can't be nice to either of them or they can't be nice to each other, then how is our community going to work and function? How will I ever understand why this person's an extreme liberal or an extreme conservative if I don't go over and talk to them and smile at them when they have a bad day and 
let them vent to me once in a while. We can't solve the world's problems by doing just grandiose uh, measures. We have to do some of these smaller activities. As far as joining the military, you know, that, that hits a whole nother realm for me because I thank God that I went away to basic training at 18. I had had zero life experience and getting my passport stamped and meeting new people. I mean, cadet basic training, I had a Jewish roommate. Okay. Um, I had never been around a Jewish person ever. And I didn't understand the differences and the similarities. So, and then of course, the other types of people you meet in the military, I never had a black roommate. I had a black roommate at West Point and learned a whole lot of interesting things there. So going out and learning about different cultures and being part of a melting pot is, is one of the benefits to joining the military. But then the other one is serving a higher purpose is is huge. It becomes part of who you are, whether you join because you're flag waving or you joined because your dad served or you joined because you wanted to leave your hometown in a hurry. Whatever the reason is for joining, it is, it is a higher calling in the end. Nobody gets through the end of basic training without getting a little something, some sort of feeling when they hear the national anthem. Like you can't, you can't make it through that period of time without being like, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right here. It hits me right in the feels. Every time. Do you think that, speaking to that kind of doing the big things versus doing the small things, do you think that we have maybe done a poor job? And if this gets political at all, we don't have to go down that way. But do you think that we have done a poor job of honoring veterans in the country? when we're like trying to solve big problems like world hunger, but maybe not taking care of people on the, the home front. Does that qualify what you're talking about, do you think? I don't know. I think there's pockets. So I live in Texas, like Texas loves their veterans. I mean, yeah. there isn't a place I can go to where if I'm wearing anything that looks like I bought it in a PX. Now you've, you've been to the base exchanges, the post exchanges, the Marine Corps exchanges, whichever ones you visited. Um, and there's the khaki pants and the blue collared Henley shirt that everybody gets issued the first time they walk in to the post exchange. Like it's the civilian attire uniform that we all buy. And then there's those shoes that they only sell there. And you see people, I, I got my oil changed a couple of weeks ago and somebody was wearing their old, before the camel colored combat boots, the old desert sand boots. And all I did was say, hey, when did you serve? And for 30 minutes, he told me war stories and it was fantastic. So mm -hmm. in Texas, the, the veteran community is very close and very supportive. So I don't feel that necessarily, um, that we're not supportive, but there are people like, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, let me make sure I get his name right. Um, and it's, it's already left me. So, but there are a lot of people that are working in politics right now to try to get not necessarily better programs for their veterans as much as more veteran representation. So right now we're, we have a lot of politicians to get into politics. Um, we have a lot of politicians, but not a lot who have a history of service. And I, I cracked that, uh, I cracked that open a little bit earlier when I said, you know, I left my hometown, got my passport stamped got some experiences. If you've lived your whole life in, I grew up in Plymouth, Wisconsin. If you lived your whole life in Plymouth, Wisconsin, and you develop your career and you continue to develop your career, you end up at, at some point in time having a very short sight of what the world looks like, a very narrow viewpoint. And in the military, we are forced, whether or not we want to, to jump into somebody else's foxhole and take a peek around from their point of view, whether it's a black male from an inner city that I had a math class with when I am a white female from a small farming community, there are a hundred things that go through his mind every day that I've never even thought about. And so um, to make a short story long, which is what I'm really good at doing, is I think we need more veterans in politics 
And specifically, we need more veterans in politics because we have a different aperture and we see the world a slightly different way. So some of those programs or some of the lack of support that we as veterans see is because we see it, we see the world through a different viewpoint and, and maybe have spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and hey, this is what an unsupported community looks like. This is what a supported community looks like. I would certainly agree with the fact that while you're serving active or reserve, you're being exposed to things you never, like you could be the most culturally sensitive person, but I guarantee you, you will see things that you have never seen before. Yeah. Um, and that's good. Like you said, it, a, a wider aperture for, for life. You said that you joined when you were 18. Um, and if I have my notes here correct, graduated the military academy in 2000 um, and followed by a period of active duty before you went to the reserves. How did your aperture change going from active duty to the reserves? So again, my story is very untraditional. I kind of have an unconventional, um, both civilian career and military career, but I got off active duty in 2007 and I actually had a five year break in service. And I had always wanted to go in the reserve, but I thought um, I didn't wanna do it right away. I wanted to set up my civilian career so that I wasn't trying to figure out the reserve life while figuring out how to be married, while figuring out how to be a new mom, while figuring out how to develop my corporate America, because I wanted a career, not a job, right? So that was a huge challenge, was trying to fit all that together. Well, when I did actually go and try to get back into a reserve unit, it turns out that my social security number with a lot of other people who hadn't done anything in, a, in more than a couple of years was flushed. So I was no longer in the IRR. I couldn't go back in the military. So it took me an additional two years to get back into the army as a reservist. And I had to go back through MEPS, which is like the, you get to duck walk with a bunch of 18 year olds to see if you're physically fit enough and can bend enough to make it through basic training. And that was fun for me as a, a former a post command uh, captain, 03, to be there with a bunch of high school students trying to figure out whether or not I can be in the military. That's a much different viewpoint coming back in. <laughs> That's, yes. that's really interesting. So you said that you were looking for a career. You must not have seen the military as a career then. I did. I, I loved the army and I, I thought I was going to be a lifer from the time I visited West Point, my junior year of high school until about six months before I got off active duty. I thought this was it. I was going to be a careerist. I did fall in love with a Marine, which, you know, judge me as you wish, but the, the two of us couldn't have really good active careers if we stayed on active duty. And he's an alpha, so he, he's a high performer. There, was, there wasn't one of us that's like, hey, my career will be second and I'll just follow you. That was going to be a challenge. He actually did get out of the Marine Corps um, and then he joined the reserve and was working and was following me. But I didn't I didn't see that as being a long-term solution. Um, we both, like I said, are very intrinsically motivated. So once he got out of the Marine Corps, he wanted to be successful in his civilian career as well. And, and that's very difficult if you're traveling every, if you're moving every two to three years, going to different countries, being a single parent. And then when we decided we wanted to have children as well, I was concerned that both of us would, again, it was a very intense time in the military. There were a lot of our soldiers, a lot of his Marines, a lot of our friends were, were coming home either injured or, or um, deceased. And the idea of having children and both of us being in really high risk jobs made me anxious. So he stayed in the reserve. I got out completely. And then eventually I just missed my tribe so much. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself, but get back in. Yeah. What, uh, I want to talk about that period in between there. What were you doing like what did you leave active to go and do career-wise and uh, I guess what ended up leading you to uh, sign on the line uh, for a second time I guess. So I was working for Shell Oil Company. Um, I worked unconventional oils. It was a fantastic career. Um, Shell's a great company. It's a lot like the military in the fact that it's a huge global organization 
that has some central organization, but also its own pockets. So you're in different companies, just like you are in the military, you're different in different organizations, just like the military, but there's this hierarchy that meets in the middle and there's, there's one kind of uh, final deciding factor. And um, so I had the opportunity to work in several different businesses within Shell Oil and, and really enjoyed it. I worked predominantly project management, program management in the construction realm, unconventionals. But as I alluded to earlier, I, I did miss the tribe. My husband would come back from his drills and he would talk about the guys. Uh, he was in an all male unit uh, doing, he was a battalion commander for, well, not yet a battalion commander, but he was in a, a reconnaissance unit out of San Antonio. And he'd come back and talk about, the, this is the best fraternity in the world. And he'd tell me all these stories. And, and I miss that because corporate America doesn't have that same concept of, oh, this person's a new guy. Let's grab him or her and take him to the gym or take him to the baseball field or take him, to, take him out to get a cocktail. Corporate America, people slide in and out of jobs frequently, but they all, everybody has their family or their organization or their, their village that they live in, but their work isn't their tribe. And in the army, the work was, was always part of my tribe. And, mm -hmm. I, and I really miss that whole, hey, Lisa, what are you doing after work? Let's go play basketball. Yeah. I, the best fraternity in the world. I think that that's a pretty accurate descriptor of the military. Do you think that that quote unquote fraternity is at odds with family life? I, I hear what you're saying and I'm like looking at it and it's interesting to hear you and your husband kind of like have the same like kind of drive to like kind of feel that sense of like connectedness. And I'm wondering how like the, the home family dynamic like plays into that when you've got two people that are competing for that. Yeah. So, you know, he's got his Marine Corps family. I've got my army family and we've got our home family for sure. The, the military is 10 times closer interpersonal relationship than corporate America has been in my experience. And there, I think sometimes the military wants to be your only family. I used to joke when I was on a high op tempo deployment schedule saying, hey, I understand, but if the army wanted you to have a family, they would have issued you one. Like we, we laugh about that now. And the army is trying to change. The military as a whole is trying to change, but I can speak a little bit more authoritarian about, with a little bit more authority with regards to the army. We recently just passed some new parental rules and allocations that give people more time to build and develop their family, whether it is the birth parent or an adoptive parent or the spouse. And again, using very gender neutral terms because that's, that's how the document is written. But it's the army is trying to say, hey, we understand the value of family more than they did 20 years ago when I first joined, 22 years ago. I've been seeing a lot on Twitter, people talking about the, the new rules and of course, Anytime there's a change in the rules, there's a lot of people that grab the pitchforks and talk about how it's this way or that way. Do you think that it was a step in the right direction? And maybe do we have further to go on that, that front of making it more kind of family focused? And I, I kind of want to like lead this into like the retention conversation, um, because I think that that's, that's an important one. Yeah, and, and that's exactly where I was going to take it. Uh, the military across the board, but again, I know specifically about the Army. The Army has a talent management task force based out of the Pentagon, and they're doing a lot of research. And how do we keep our good people? You know, this, the idea of those awesome World War II, World War I generals, they were amazing. They were a little bit like dictators. When you get into all the memoirs, the biographies, the autobiographies, they all had a really shaky home life, like almost, almost to, to the very last one. I, I have yet to find a book about, hey, this really successful general who sacrificed so much for this war, that war, or this, this military service had a really great relationship with their wife or was really close with their children. You just don't read a lot of that. And, and that's fine at that point in time, but that's not what the new generation wants. 
And so our talented individuals want to have this work-life balance. And let's be honest, there's no such thing as work-life balance. You're either working or you're trying to live a different life, but there's never, there's never a balance. It's, it's always a, it's always a teeter totter. And so to keep our talented individuals, we have to give, we have to look at what they want. And I'll, I'll take a corporate America example. I don't want more pay. Like whatever job I work next, it's not going to be for more pay. It's going to be for better benefits, a better, better 401k, maybe more vacations, maybe more perks. Maybe I want to fly on the company jet. But, you know, at some point in time in your life, if you're a talented individual, you're looking for big picture benefits. And you know that once you retire, no matter what your job is, you hope there's someone home to meet you there. Like you hope there's someone still there at the end of the day. And so the research that was done, I, I'm going to assume it was well done, but it's all under, under the umbrella of trying to retain good talent. And, and I'll dovetail that into being a reservist. So as a reserve battalion commander, having eight companies and each of those companies having 140 plus or minus personnel, I look at who are my leaders and what makes them good. Well, if I pull too hard on them as a reservist, the same intrinsic motivation that makes them good at doing army stuff is the same person that goes home to their family or their friends or their extracurriculars and also goes to that full-time job. So they're always going to be a driven human being. Well, if I pull them too hard in the military, their calculus of quitting is, is a term my husband uses a lot. Their calculus of quitting changes significantly because they also want to be successful in their civilian job and in their home job. So we always have to, home job being, you know, spouse, w- whatever their home life looks like. So we always have to balance in the military how much we're taking from an individual. And I think, I think the Army is trying to do that to retain the right I think that the way that they're going about it is, I I think that that's right. Like you mentioned, pay is not really as big of an issue as I think that most people think it is. And I I know that I felt that when, you know, as a junior enlisted person was very quick to, you know, uh, snub my, my fingers at how much I made. But when people talk about the, the other benefits that you get, whether it's tuition assistance or, um, you know, it really set home when I got my first full-time job, at, like outside of the service again, and uh, saw how much I was paying for health insurance. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. starting to to kind of put that together now. But yeah, I, I think that the family aspect of it is much more important, um, but a, a hard problem to solve. Like you said, you're solving for something where we need to be operationally ready and you know, be ready to go at a moment's notice, but also make sure people are home for dinner every night. Those are right. two very conflicting uh, missions. But I think one of the things, and, and we all do it, we do it again in corporate America just as much, everything's an emergency right now. And, and so I've tried really hard to talk to people who work for me and say, listen, unless it's an actual emergency, please don't be checking your email at 10 o'clock at night, go to bed you know, cuddle with your dog, watch Netflix, go to the gym, whatever it is. But we have to say exactly what you were saying. If you, if you want people to be ready to deploy at the drop of a hat, you don't have to steal the rest of their life. It needs to be a priority when it's an emergency. And then the rest of the time, maybe allow them to be home for dinner. You know, what's going to happen if we stay till seven o'clock every night, five days a week, and then I'm calling you on Saturday and Sunday. When it's time to go to Syria, is are, are we going to be ready or are we going to already be burnt out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it kind of could easily be wiped out before you're called to literally go overseas and spend a year living in a tent um, right. and, and do that whole thing. Yeah, that, it's a very hard problem. Um, I'm not really sure how to kind of separate those two things because they're trying to draw a line in between the the family and say, okay, when you're not at work, you're spending time with your family. But 
I think that, and maybe this was just my perspective as, again, a, a junior enlisted person, not really thinking super big picture, but I certainly felt like my entire life was dominated by the military, no matter what. Like it wasn't, I didn't have a family at the time. Um, and so I wasn't really going through those struggles. And, but I can only assume that it would be even worse had I had a, a wife and kid at home. What, what do you make of that? Um, how, how do people separate themselves? And I would be curious to hear the compare and contrast from active duty to reserves. That's a, a much different uh, line to be drawing. How do people really leave the uniform at work? I think you have to be really deliberate about it. Like, um, so we make a point, I make a point with my key staff personnel to say, okay, now every Monday at one o'clock, we're having a call. So on Sunday night, don't be, let, let's not be bugging each other. Let's let, let you help your kids finish their homework up. You know, Sunday night is family time. Monday, we're all going to get together and talk about it. So be deliberate. Say, hey, I don't want to hear from you unless it's an emergency. And, and then also say, hey, these are the things that constitute it. It's called a CCIR, you know, a, a commander's critical incident report. Hey, these are the CCIRs. These are the things you have to call me about. Is somebody sick? Is somebody dying? Um, is somebody in jail? Other than that, it can probably wait till Monday morning. Um, but as leaders, we have to be the ones who push that because, and, and they have to see it. So one of the things I do is because I'm a part-time military, I work on army stuff on like from four to five o'clock in the morning, every morning, check my email, make sure there's nothing out there that's waiting on me. Well, I need to make sure my soldiers don't think that they're expected to check their email at five o'clock in the morning. I'm doing that so that when I'm dropping my kids off at school or I'm working my day job, I can disconnect because I know nothing is going to wait on me for more than 24 hours. So I have, I have settings where my emails won't send until seven o'clock, or I will write all my text messages to people and just leave them as drafts and send them at seven or eight o'clock in the morning so that people don't get that expectation or don't feel like um, I'm setting an expectation that they have to work 24 seven. That's an extremely conscious leadership decision. I really like that. And I think that there's more people that could benefit from that, not even just in the, the military sphere, but in the corporate world as well. Um, it's much more prevalent in like working from home and fully remote. Yes. Uh, being too tied to the computer and the kind of a perk of making your own schedule kind of, but then you end up working kind of weird hours and next thing you know, it's a 10, 11 at night and you're like, why am I, why am I doing this right now? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, an interesting problem we'll be facing, I guess, going forward in a more remote world. What was the, the call to come back and join the reserves? Um, so I mentioned the the tribe. Um, I really, I really did miss that feeling of being part of a team. I was jealous of my husband's fraternity stories. And I also got contacted via Facebook and, and got recruited into a unit. Social media does have a benefit for, for those who don't like it. But yeah, I got contacted by a West Point grad. Hey, we've got a unit. We've got a, a spot. You would be perfect for it any chance you'd be interested. And the minute that seed was planted, plus the, I miss having the constant family. And, and that also comes from, I had, um, I went to Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, number one. <laughs> and then I went to Operation Iraqi Freedom, number one, came back, went to grad school, and then spent two years in South Korea. So in my seven years of active service, I had well over four years of that time, if you include all my, my basic course and my advanced course, where I was living and breathing military, even when I was out of uniform. So 24 seven, I was on post living in barracks, um, surrounded by that environment of, hey, I'm going to the DFAC, you wanna come with me? Hey, I'm, I gotta run to the PX, do you need anything? hey, I want to go shoot, but I need a battle buddy to go to the military range on Tuesday. Can you come with me? 
and when I got out of the military, none of those conversations happened. Nobody ever just knocked on my door randomly and said, Hey, let's go here. And, and so I missed that. And then my very first drill. So my very first time being a reservist, no uniform, nothing. I showed up and they're like, Hey, this is our like, development family weekend. And we're going to go rock climbing. And I said, okay, I don't have my family here. And I don't know that I have the right clothes for this, but we all went rock climbing and did our team building event. And the vehicle that I was in was a bunch of old infantry guys. And they're like, hey, did you see that skydiving place that we drove past on the way to the rock climbing place? Let's go jump out airplanes. Yes, yes. And that was exactly what I was missing. So I fell hook, line and sinker after my very first drill because it was, hey, Lisa, you wanna? And the answer is always yes, of course I do whatever I'm, I'm game. Let's go on a picnic. Let's go jump out of airplanes, whatever. And, and that's what, that was the, the call back in. And what keeps me in is literally every time I go to drill, somebody does the exact same thing. Oh, it's 11 o'clock. You ready for lunch? Like you don't, you don't eat by yourself unless you try hard. You don't, you don't go to dinner by yourself unless you try hard. You, you don't run. You don't even go for a two mile run by yourself unless you're, you tell everybody to back off. And mm -hmm. it's, it's this community that's just, you're never alone, but you're also, nothing's ever forced upon you. Like, I don't feel like I have forced friends, but I feel like I have um, comrades everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. I will be interested when you end up fast forwarding to getting out for good and to hear about what your experience is like. I know that it's a very common problem when people get out, you're just like, all, you know, literally one day you're just super close and you like see all these people every day. And like you said, you're doing all of these things. And then all of a sudden you're just not. And um, I remember when I got out, I literally like flew off the, the carrier we were out to see at the time. And I just like never saw anybody again. And it was yeah. so strange. Like I had one or two close friends that got out at the same time as me and we kind of moved away together but all of those people you're just like I wonder how they're doing now <laughs> um and I think that that may contribute to some of the the problems we see like on the veteran front like that kind of missing purpose yep. um, lack of community problems that are very prevalent in the community so I'm going to do a shameless plug right here and now so I'm on the board of directors of Team Red, White, and Blue, and it's a 5013C nonprofit. Mike Irwin was the founder. Uh, it's in every major city in the U.S. and outside of every major military base overseas. It's called Team Red, White, and Blue, and it's, you know, you got a lot of veterans organizations that are about shooting or fighting or, you know, something combative, or you've got places like the VFW where you can go get popcorn and a beer. This is a fitness based organization that does lots of volunteer work. You know, we'll put flags on headstones for Memorial Day and veterans cemeteries, but we also run marathons or do Tuesday morning bike rides downtown. And it is just, and you don't have to be prior service member. You can just be somebody who supports the military, but it is exactly what we're talking about. It's that that tribal feeling of having a group of people that's in your general area that says, Hey, Lisa, I saw your Facebook post today. Looks like you're having a bad day. Let's go for a run tomorrow morning. Or can you meet up for a bike ride or let's meet up for a beer, whatever. But yeah, big fan of team red, white, and blue, super involved with them now so that I can avoid exactly what you were talking about, which is that feeling of separation and loneliness that comes from being part of a big purpose-driven organization and then, and then not. Mm -hmm. Where can uh, people go to follow along and, and get involved? Literally teamredwhiteandblue.org. That's it. Perfect. Yep. Nice and straightforward and easy. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Um, you've mentioned fitness a lot and you had kind of mentioned before that you are uh, maybe a former marathoner, current marath marathoner. Is that, <laughs> is that right? So I can get talked into damn near any fitness competition. 
You so sound I'm very done. agreeable. I, yes. I'm thinking about just like throwing out some random invites for crazy things. Maybe we should line something up. So a girlfriend of mine calls me up. She's like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of in a funk. Let's do an ultra marathon. And I said, okay. And she's like, really? I said, sure. So we signed up for it. I ended up having shoulder surgery, so I couldn't train at all which what I didn't understand is after my shoulder surgery, there were months where I wasn't allowed to run. So we're, she and I have signed up for, I think it was a 52K off-road ultra marathon. And this wasn't like 10 years ago. This was last year. We're in our, our mid forties and I can't train and we live in two different cities. So we're not hanging out together. I'm just walking. I'll walk for eight hours a day wearing a weight vest, trying to prep for this ultra. And um, she ends up having an emergency surgery and can't show up the day of the race. So I'm now by myself, completely suckered into this. Next thing you know, it's, it was one of the best days I've had in a long time. Every, every time I have my glass of wine, I drink out of my little finishers class. They gave me yeah. a little glass and literally every day because I was so proud of finishing. And it was being, I live outside of San Antonio. So being in the Austin area, it's partway between Austin and San Antonio. There was a lot of retired military. I met, I exchanged phone numbers with people. There was one guy, he was a Marine who bonked and was on the side of the road and couldn't even stand up, but it was a trail. So no cars could come and pick him up. So I helped him to the next stop, met this former retired Air Force pastor, a preacher man, and we went through part of it. We even called his wife at one point in time because he was like, I'm done. I'm like, let's just call your wife, you know? And so, yes, I can get suckered into anything and, and everything. Um, next on my plate is a jujitsu competition. And so I haven't signed up yet. I'm saying it out loud so that I can't back out of it, but I'm going to do another jujitsu competition. And for me, fitness is, fitness is not about physical health. For me, fitness is about mental health. And it's also about the groups that you're around. So marathoning, I did, um, I've only done one, but I did an Ironman triathlon. It's fun to train for it because I get that time alone. I get, you know, a 20 mile run is a whole lot of time to work through whatever demons you have in your head. But then when you actually go there on race day, you pass people, people pass you, people cheer for you. The lady giving out the soup broth at mile 20 of the 26.2 mile marathon suddenly becomes your best friend because you've been racing for 10 hours and you know, you're hugging on her and you've never met her before. I just, I think fitness is an avenue for spiritual and mental health that people who aren't into fitness are missing. Yeah, I don't know how else to say it, but it's a huge part of who I am, but not for my physical conditioning as much as my mental health. I was gonna ask like what, what motivates you to kind of like take on these big physical challenges but i you kind of touched on that i can resonate with that 100 it's really difficult for me personally to understand when people don't have that because it's like i i can't even think straight and and maybe that's like a, a personal affliction but i like if i don't do something in the morning i just like every day is a shit day kind <laughs> of like I I can't think I don't get anything done I just am scrambled and that like is endurance specifically I think is just unbelievably rewarding yeah and just like hours and hours of grueling uh pain and and whatnot I uh haven't I'm in the same boat as you as like not having signed up and I keep saying it out loud to make sure that I um like actually do it but I have been training for a uh, half Ironman in June and okay. I've been like training and training, but I haven't like bought the ticket yet. And I have been so scared because I'm like, this is going to be terrible, but it is, um, it's going to be awesomely terrible. Yeah. <laughs> There's a weird, I get a really personally get a very weird feeling that's uh, like deep into runs. And I, I've never asked anybody this ever actually. So this is maybe we'll make for some good conversation, but I get a really weird feeling deep into a run when it feels like you just kind of like everything breaks and you yes. get like kind of weirdly emotional. Yes. Like really, okay, so that's a real thing. 
It is a real thing. You, know you get I'm your talking. runners high and then all of a sudden it's like, it's pure exhaustion. Oddly enough, my husband knows that this happens to me when I go out on runs. And for a long time when I was doing more endurance training, right now I'm not, but when I was doing more endurance training, he would literally sit there with a, sh a protein shake and my running shoes. And we would get to this point where everything was really tense. You're married, right? No matter how much you love your spouse, at some point in time, you're like, you are the roommate that will never leave. Oh my God. And he, I mean, I he's to an spend the rest of my life like this. Yes. And he's an amazing man. But for the love of God, how do you still not know where the spoons go? Like, come on, man. And it, when you start grinding just a little bit on that day to day life, he'll give you my shoes and a protein bar or a protein shake, and I will go and I will just go. And I'll go without a watch. I'll go without my GPS. I won't have my phone. I don't have earbuds. And I just let everything go in my brain. And I know it's time to turn around when I hit the point that you were just talking about, when it's the complete and utter release of its ecstasy and hate and anger and passion and love. And you want to cry, but you want to shake, but you kind of start laughing at yourself and you're thinking, oh God, if people could hear my brain right now, they'd think I'm nuts. And, and you just, and then you come home and my husband will be there with another protein shake for me and say, are we good now? I'm like, yes, <laughs> this was the argument we had. It's already settled. You don't have to worry about it. You apologized. We're good. Thanks. Put that spoon wherever the hell you feel like it. I don't care. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is so funny. I, I've never really been able to describe that to somebody, but I, I felt it a couple of weeks ago on a very long bike ride. And I was like, I, I've never biked in my, I mean, I've ridden a bike, but I've right. never like biked, like road biked before. And so I like go and buy this road bike and I'm like, I need to see if I can even like ride this even close to this many miles. The yes. path is like 56 miles or whatever. Yep. And I go out there and about three quarters of the way that happened. And I was like, oh yeah, like this is happening. Um, yes. And it, it is just, it is a lot happening at once and, and very difficult to describe. So I'm glad that that's a real thing. And I'm not, or not the, the bad crazy, just the good crazy. You know, I, I used to train triathletes. Um, I did it online. And one of my athletes asked me one time, how do you know when you're, when you've trained enough? And I said, when you go out for the next long run or long ride and you have nothing left to think about, that's when you're trained. Yep. That's very, very true. Uh, and I, I mean, you can apply that to anything too, like with walking go, if you've got like a busy mind or something like you yeah. need to be moving until you don't have anything else to think about. And it's just like empty space in your head. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. exactly. I guess other than maybe that little bit of advice, what would you give to anybody that's, especially if you've trained people and maybe you can just direct it at me or anybody that's listening, that's interested in um, endurance sports what do you think is the most beneficial thing that most people aren't doing? The best exercise is the one you'll do. What people fail to think about is we all want to be, we all want to have this body type or we want to be able to eat what, whatever, whatever we want, or we're focused on, Hey, I want this image. And so exercise is always part of that equation. You don't lose weight. You don't get off of heart meds. You don't, you don't gain weight. If, if you're trying to build mass, you don't, you know, for me, you don't settle your brain without that, those physical fitness activities. So, Hey, what do I need to do to get skinny? What will you actually do? If it's a bar class, if it's water aerobics, if it's, you just talked about walking, I think what people don't do and they really need to do is they need to figure out what they love and what their true goals are. Like, I don't want to get skinny to get skinny. Looking good in a bikini is only important. Well, I live in Texas. So for like seven months out of the year, it's important. But, you know, that's getting fit for your wedding day. That's not, wait, that's not a long-term goal. What, what can you do that you'll do forever? Like as you're training for this half Ironman, are you enjoying the training or are you drudging through it? And if every day, now, 50% of your training is going to be a drudge period. Like nobody's that motivated, Yeah. but 
at the end of the week, when you look at your mileage, you're like, God damn, that was so much time. Oh, I wasted. Or, you know, you feel just, or, oh, look at my training next week. I don't know if I have time for it. If, if your training makes you anxious, then you probably should do something else. And the most important exercise is the one you're going to do. And that makes you big picture, feel really good about yourself. Cause then, then you'll keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that sustainable goal, like that idea of like a sustainable long-term thing is one of the largest problems that I see from somebody that likes to do this stuff um, with people, with their eating, Mm -hmm. with exercise. It's like, it's a chore, but you're, and it, it is, it's a chore in that it's like kind of a drudge, but the ideal long-term thing is to get to the point where it's like, I am looking forward to like my, my walk or, or whatever it is, where it's not just like a checkbox thing. Yes. And you're like, like you said, fitness is more of like a mental thing for you. It's like, just, it's not like this tiny little thing. It's like, you're, it's kind of your life and right. your life doesn't need to revolve around it, but it's something that's, I think, non-negotiable and yes. it helps with the mental health, at least non-negotiable for me. I, uh, right. I think that we see eye to eye on the, uh, the mental clarity and the, the other benefits that that brings. But for those people who are challenged to on how to get going, like maybe Maybe they're a body that isn't in motion and they're having problems beating that initial, getting that inertia started. Mm -hmm. Um, Those those people, it's simple to put it on the calendar. Like we don't want to go to the dentist, but we do it every six months to a year, or at least you should. I guess not everybody does, but you don't you don't want to go to the doctors. I definitely have days where going to church is pretty hard. (laughs) <laughs> um, just different things like, oh my God, I have all these other things to do, but putting your workouts on your calendar, like you would any other appointment and even including on your calendar reminder, today's a five mile run at, you know, an ADRP, um, or PRE perceived rate of exertion and, and have that time blocked off. Like you would any other time and block off time to shower and block off time to have your pre-workout snack. And if you put it on your calendar, like anything else, it also starts becoming a routine and it, it stops being, okay, well, I'll do it in an hour. Ah, man, I really got to make one more phone call. Like just, just starting it as a routine and finding, finding a way to fit it into your day sometimes relieves the stress of having to work out. Yeah. Well, and make it a priority. It's not um, something that's just, you know, if I get to it, Anything that's like a, if I have time, doesn't happen. Right. Um, I'm a very firm believer that everybody has the time and money for the things that are important to them. And um, whatever's on that list happens and what's not doesn't. And so um, kind of a good exercise in just looking at what's important to you as kind of an individual. I want to take this topic and because I think that it plays into the next question that I want to ask you something you probably get asked about a lot. Um, you went to ranger school, correct? I did. I did. Yep. 2015. First of all, like that's so cool. Um, uh, if all of my notes and reading are accurate, you're one of the first women to get the tab. You were 37 when the average age is 23. Yep. Uh, that's congratulations. Like that's so cool and like a very monumental time in history but one that should have happened probably earlier um but still cool and powerful nonetheless was that everything that you thought it would be oh interesting um I think I didn't have many expectations so the physical aspects of it so physical fitness believe it or not does not come easy for me I've had two shoulder surgeries and a hip surgery all very important joints if you're going to rock for days and days on end. So needless I'm to say. I'm guessing it would be. <laughs> yes. And, and when you're 37 um, and you don't recover real quick, that's that kind of compounds the soreness and all the, the fun stuff. So um, was it everything I expected it to be? I expected it to be an opportunity of a lifetime. And if I didn't say yes, I would have to go back at my life and have a regret. So I did it because since 
since as early as I can remember, my mom has always said to me, never say I could have, I should have, or I would have. So even though I was 37, when the opportunity came up, I thought, man, if I say no to this opportunity, I'm going to say I could have, I should have, or I would have. And that would kill my mother and everything that I've been raised to believe in. I think that that's a good philosophy uh, to, to live by. Did you feel like there was extra focus on you? I would imagine like being in the first class that that's anytime that there's a, a drastic shift in personnel or how the, if the rules are changing, I'd imagine there's kind of like a weird error of something feeling off to yes. maybe the instructors or other people there. Did you feel any like type of way uh, from the other people, the instructors, other people in the course, anything like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, we were complete freaks. Like nobody knew what to do with us. Um, everybody had these grand thoughts. Uh, the packing list for the first integrated class changed like 15 times in less than a month. It was add sports bras. And then it was a different amount of sports bras. And then it was adding feminine products. And then it was specifying what type. Then they added, you must be on birth control. I'm like, what? Who is even talking about this? Stuff? Like they just, they got so freaked out that, and of course, as a 37 year old woman, who's a hunter, a mother, I camp, I've been in the military for you know, more than a minute, I've done a ton of stuff and nobody ever had to tell me, hey, you need to take care of your girliness. Like nobody's ever had to tell me that my whole life. And now I have the Department of the Army listing off options for birth control for me to go to a training school. And so it was so hard for everybody. They just, they just freaked out. What kind of sports bras could we wear? Do they have to be cotton? Well, some types of sports bras work and don't work in sweaty environments. Like, come on now, let's, let's, let's not outline this. So there was that before we ever got there. Then the hair standards changed. Men have to shave their heads. Women had to keep their hair at least a quarter inch long because a shaved head on a woman is considered a fattish haircut. So it made us stick out even more, right? Because that's fashionable. I mean, I can see braids and cornrows, but not a shaved head. So this, you know, the army regulations just weren't ready for this. And then, and then we showed up and people wanted to do the right thing, but we were so busy trying to think what the right thing might be. We, we missed common sense and in a couple of steps along the way. But the great thing is once the, the first 19 of us got on deck with our quarter inch of hair and our properly outlined bras, et cetera, our classmates were freaked out and then it didn't matter. We were all tired, we were all hungry. As long as the women could hold their rucksacks over their head and do squats, as long as the men could, it didn't matter. And you know, we did stick out. We stuck out because we had longer hair. We stuck out because we had higher voices. We stuck out because we had to shower at a different time as the men. But so did the couple of minorities because it's there's not a lot of um, Black, Hispanic, et cetera. So there's not a lot of skin diversity, skin tone diversity in the ranger school formations for whatever reason. And there's not a lot of guys that come wearing glasses. So if you wore glasses, you stuck out. If you had a quarter inch of hair, you stuck out. If your skin was a different color, we had the really pasty guys too that also stuck out. We had the really tall guy that stuck out. We had a fat guy. I don't know how you get to ranger school and you're chubby, but we had a chunky guy that could move his own weight like nobody's business, did great on the five mile run, but he was thick. Well, everybody wanted to help him lose weight. So there was a bunch of people that stuck out. So the way I dealt with the fact that we were getting a little bit extra attention was that the really tall guy next to me who wears glasses and had acne, he also was getting yelled at extra because your eye naturally catches whatever sticks out and mm -hmm. we stuck out. But yeah, after that first day, our classmates kind of were like, okay, well, we've got girls, yay, move on. The hardest challenge was for the ranger instructors. Now here's a group of people that come in, have to train us, but then they leave and they're exposed to the media. There was newspaper articles, there was congressionals, there was TVs, TV cameras, news cameras. There was their buddies sending them text messages. They would be as professional as they could possibly be at the school. And then they would go home and all the unprofessional rubbish that was out there about integrating 
ranger school was thrown directly at these, these poor guys. Like I actually felt bad for them. And then they had to come back the next day and work another 12 hour shift and pretend like I'm just another ranger student. So for me, the professionalism of the ranger instructors, even the ones that struggled with integration is beyond reproach. Like I, I can't imagine what, what kind of shit they were getting from their peers for, for lack of a more professional way of saying it. That had to be really hard. And the fact that you know we saw a little bit of um, differential treatment, but some of it might have just been the fact that I was five four and thirty seven years old and had a high voice and not necessarily I'm a girl. Yeah, I would imagine that would be such a weird thing. And a little bit of that maybe because the military's history, we talk about like just tradition. And this is like a very, very slippery slope because there are a lot of quote unquote traditions about how the things that are done that are directly in the way of the military progressing as an organization towards more equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I would imagine that there was maybe some crusty old instructors that maybe had something to say internally, maybe whether or not they said it's another story, but I, I'm imagining that in my head of them. Oh, like, yeah. oh not in my army kind of yes. like chat. Yes. I, God, I hate that. But um, yeah, I. But that actually goes back to where we started, you know, talking about leadership in World War One and World War Two versus a more family inclusive leadership style now. Like the, the people we have that are willing to raise their hand and fight and die for our nation do not look like they did 60 years ago. And part of that is because we no longer have to bake our own bread. So we don't need somebody home all day to do domestic tasks. What does that mean? That means in a two-parent household, both parents can easily work and still feed the kids and have a clean home and still be productive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the world has changed a ton since the 1940s and the army is catching up. I think we're actually probably ahead. The military is ahead in a lot of areas, but yes, it is, it is hard. But my, my dad graduated ranger school in 1968. And I figured if that crusty old ranger can be okay with his daughter going, the same guy who didn't even want me joining the army, definitely these 30 somethings can figure out how to be okay with it. What a cool follow-up of a legacy. I didn't realize that your dad had uh, had also been one. Did he look at you different or say anything that was meaningful after the fact? Oh, uh, you know what? It's actually a very horrible, depressing story. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind sharing it now, I got to hear it. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so, you know, the, the worst part about ranger school for me is I recycled every phase and, and it was terrible. But oddly enough, somebody had to. Like one of the females had to stay in austere environment for an extended period of time so that the, all the arguments against, hey, women are physically fit enough, but they can't survive in the field for extended periods of time, that argument had to be beaten away. And what better way than having a 37-year-old mother of two who's a part-time soldier who had to buy uniforms in order to go to ranger school because I only had one and I needed five. What better to have me at ranger school for six months? Well. I recycled Florida. Not many people recycle Florida. And that's the third and final phase of ranger school. And when I found out I recycled, I got my mail that same day. And when I opened my mail, I had a, uh, a very artfully written letter from my husband that said, hey, your dad's sick. You need to call him whenever you have time. Give me a call. So I called my husband, got the 411, understood that my dad was sick. He said, hey, your dad does not want you to know about this. So don't tell him I told you, just, I don't know. I don't know what to do. (laughs) Your dad's going to kick my ass kind of thing. Um, So I called my dad and he's, he's barely able to talk. It turns out he had an extremely rare form of cancer of a gland in his neck and a a uh, salivatory, I can't say it, gland, Um, less than 2000 cases reported worldwide. 
and um, he had gone through and they had tried to remove the cancer surgically, ended up removing part of the jawbone. And my father was always an extremely handsome man. Like even, even at 69, he had that strong jaw, the, the military brush haircut. Um, he, with four fused or three fused vertebrae in his back and open ulcers on his legs and gout, he would walk down a flight of stairs every single morning and lift weights. I mean, he jacked steel, like he had hundred pound kettlebell type jacking steel. And this guy was a monster, just, just amazing in so many ways. And now on the phone, I can barely understand him because his, his jaw has been partially removed. So I'm finding out about this when I recycle Florida, I call home. I, it's, it's a huge kick in the gut. It turns out he wasn't able to fly down for my ranger school graduation because he was so sick. Uh, had I graduated, had I not recycled Florida, he would have been able to come down. So he was not able to attend the graduation. Um, I did get to see him a couple more times before he had finally passed away. But I, when I did see him those couple of times, we were talking more of, hey, are you right with God type discussions and not really, hey, here's, here's our, our ranger school experience. We didn't get to really tell a lot of stories there. So that was really unfortunate. It was a, it was an opportunity missed for me. It's also one of those things where I kind of, I kind of kicked myself because if I had done a little bit better, maybe, maybe I could have shared that really happy moment with my dad, but I did take, um, I had a drive on tab and that I had been given by a guy I never met. A drive on tab is somebody who has gone to ranger school previously sending you his tab. Now I had one from one of my classmates. He took it off his uniform, gave it to me and said, you give this back to me upon graduation. I gave that one back to him. I did get a second drive on tab from a guy I didn't know who was no longer active service. And, um, I carried that with me every day that I was in the field. It was in, it was in my left breast pocket next to my heart. And it is now in the casket with my dad. Wow. Uh, this is a good thing that we don't have, uh, might not be showing this on video because I'm here getting choked up. <laughs> <laughs> what a powerful story. Um, and I, I hope that you get to have that conversation someday. What, uh, what a cool experience. I'm sure that he's very proud. I hope so. Uh, I don't know if I, I know it would be how, uh, how neat. Um, I don't even know how to follow that up. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Brock. <laughs> no, no, no. You're okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I know that that's incredibly vulnerable, and um, I, I I like that kind of stuff. That's good. Uh, we we need more of it. Yes. I I want to close out. We were kind of talking about diversity in the military as a whole, and the the progression of the army and military as an organization towards um, more equal opportunity and whatnot where else do we still need work and how do we get there? I'm going to start with the, how do we get there? Honestly. So without identifying the end state, we talk about diversity all the time. And, and my favorite diversity example is my last star major um, was from Louisiana, uh, African-American, actually Creole. Like I, I don't, I don't call him African-American, but he, he was dark skinned, had a Louisiana Louisiana accent. It's really even hard to say that. And we looked nothing alike. He was a solid eight or nine inches taller than me. Here we are as a command team. We literally looked like um, we were at two diverse ends of the spectrum. Well, I worked for Shell Oil Company for 12 years. He works for an energy company. He lives in Houston now. I lived in Houston for 10 years. Truthfully, we were of one mind. When I would say something, he's like, yep, right on, ma'am. So even though he and I looked like we covered the whole spectrum of the rainbow, in truth, there was no cognitive diversity. So that leadership team, that command team was not a diverse team in reality. And so where we are failing, and this is, this is my personal opinion, not a military opinion, but where we are failing is we're so busy thinking about building a beautiful cornucopia of human beings that we neglect why we're looking for diversity. And so starting with the how and getting back to where or what we're failing on, 
the, the how we fix it is we have to make sure that people from every background have an opportunity, either in corporate America or the military, but have the opportunity to apply. They're exposed. We recruit. We need to go into the inner city and we need to go to the redneck hoedown town. Like we need to have our recruiters out there grabbing every able body and bringing them into this beautiful organization of mixed races and genders and religions and creeds and make sure that everybody has that one goal to fight and serve our nation, but also they have the opportunity to not. So I don't want you because you're black or white or male or female or gay or straight or trans. That's not what I want. I want your diversity of thought. So we need to recruit diversity of thought by going into diverse communities and recruiting all of the appropriate personnel, but we don't have to hire them just because of their adjectives. And I actually have a book coming out this year called Delete the Adjective. The whole idea is I wanna be awesome because of who I am, not because I'm a female soldier, not because I'm an older uh, engineer. Like I don't want any of those adjectives to matter. I wanna be awesome for the capabilities I bring. So again, what do we need to do? We need to recruit in diverse communities, but we need to hire based on capabilities and truly be a meritocracy. And so we're, what we're failing at is we're failing at looking at what people truly bring to the table. If you are a white Trumpster, <laughs> let's go back into politics because it's so easy, even though I keep saying I don't want to talk <laughs> politics. If you're a white Trumpster or you're a black Trumpster, you're still a Trumpster. If you're with her, Hillary Clinton, and you're a female or you're a male that ha wears an I'm with her button, just because you're a male and, he and she's a female doesn't mean you're diverse You, you if you're of one mind. So we're, what we're failing at is we're looking at diversity, I think, through an inappropriate lens. And that's, I don't want to build a pretty cornucopia. I want to build diversity of thought so that we can grow and bring um, innovation into our community. And by looking for diversity of thought, we will naturally get that cultural diversity. I could be wrong. I really like that. I, I think that that's a, a unique way of looking at it, cognitive diversity. I hadn't really thought of it or heard it put that way before, but I like that. I'll, uh, I'll be looking forward to reading your book. Where, um, where can people go to, and I kind of want to plug you here, where can people go to find out more about you and uh, hear more about the book? So God willing, um, my manuscript is with the editors right now, so I don't have a deadline or a timeline yet, but I do have a website. I think it's just Lisa or delete the adjective, uh, dot com. And I don't even know that for sure, uh, but I am very active on social media, specifically um, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I love LinkedIn, Facebook. I will not accept on my personal account, but I do have a Lisa Jaster delete the adjective account where I throw out a lot of my humble opinions. Again, not representative of the military, just of Lisa Jaster. And, um, and I talk about this a lot. I'm a uh, I'm one of the partners in an organization called the Talent War, or it's called Talent War Group. And we do executive coaching, leadership coaching, and keynote speaking. And that is actually, I, I publish a lot of blogs there on their various um, media sites as well, Talent War Group. Awesome. I'll be sure to include that in the show notes and people awesome. can follow up with you there. Lisa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brock. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Your listenership helps me better educate people like you and the rest of our nation's military, both past and present, on building a successful life outside of military service. If you're looking for more ways the top vets are leading more effective lifestyles, building businesses, and using the resources designed specifically for you, press here for a selection of some of the best clips. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date, and I will be talking with you soon.